Time now for this week's Health Matters. Paul Kritz with you, along with P.A. Lynn Zabo. And uh, I guess we're just we're running it back from last week because that was yeah, so part interesting. part two, because I thought it was fun. <laughs> it was. Yeah, so, floating head syndrome. What a fun thing. So it, these are these are the, the, the syndromes, diseases, and things that are kind of off the beaten path and, and you yeah. certainly don't want to have. Uh, but uh, uh, just a lot of very interesting uh, information. Take two. Yeah, it's kind of generally interesting, I think, to see the range of pathology and what can go wrong in a really complex organism. Mm -hmm. So it makes one respect one's body, I think. Um, and it, this is also a reminder that people actually do suffer to an extent from some of these. These ones um, are less catastrophic, I think, to people's lives, but they're sure weird. Okay, so uh, less catastrophic than uh, than what we visited and talked right. about last week? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exploding head syndrome is, see, it sounds... <laughs> it sounds <terrible. laughs> really bad, but these yeah. aren't so bad. Okay, all right. Yeah. So the first one is it's actually pretty benign and common. It's called geographic tongue, and it's a weird appearance of um, the normal variation of a tongue surface. And you're talking about the top of the tongue, so what we call the dorsal aspect. Um, and I see it constantly. It's super common up here. Oftentimes really? people don't know they have it. But if you think of the papillae on the tongue as a shag rug, uh -huh. okay, usually people's shag rug has an even... Um, sizing to it so that it all looks uniform and this this and another variation um called hairy tongue are actually where the um stop <laughs> making me laugh I'm, I'm uh, not, yeah, hairy tongue okay yeah, <laughs> where the, in geographic tongue the the levels of the shag are cut at well at different levels okay. so so it looks irregular and it can look like really weird, like a dog with mange, you know? Oh, wow, all right. And some all parts right. are really ugly looking, but it's just <laughs> an uneven surface. And then the hairy tongue um, is actually a disruption and the papillae keep growing and they don't break down. Yikes. So things like brushing your tongue or eating maybe like an apple that has a little bit of give you know, like crunch to it, mm -hmm. that that actually helps these papillae stay um, a reasonable length. Wow, but okay. sometimes that doesn't work for people. And when you see it, and I have seen it commonly up here, it's it's like, oh my God, you know, what the hell? Um, and, and it's interesting because the patients themselves almost never notice it, probably because wow. they don't look at tongues all day like I do. So um, it doesn't feel differently to them? They don't come in for with tongue complaints because of this? Sometimes moms will see it, see it in their kids mm -hmm. and, and they'll be alarmed, but mostly the individual doesn't pay too much attention to it. Okay. It doesn't hurt. Um, there can also be cracking on the dorsal surface of the tongue, and that's actually geographic tongue, and that looks, looks like looking down at a, at probably the Grand Canyon. So okay. you have these cracks and all these like side cracks, and sometimes it's painful, and sometimes they actually treat it, but mostly it's a tincture of time thing. Wow. So it just gets better on its own. So things that make it worse are caffeine, viral illnesses, pretty common, um, smoking, and poor oral hygiene. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all benign. It usually responds spontaneously in a week or two. Wow. Okay. Probably a reminder to brush your tongue, which m most people don't. I don't like doing that. It makes my tongue like like feel like 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 abraded. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose you could do it like a swish and spit might okay. accomplish that too, but but maybe eat an apple once in a while. That happens, yeah. sure. So the Keep next the one, dentist away then, that's what you think. <laughs> okay. Go to the dentist, yeah. Um, one uh, that I really like is alien hand syndrome, which I think, <laughs> this is a very Dr. Strange love. Isn't okay, it? all right. Yeah. So this is a rare condition, first diagnosed in 1908 or first recorded. And basically people lose control of one of their hands because the brain isn't able to control it. And so it randomly moves on its own. This is like Dr. Strangely. Exactly. Yeah, you mentioned Dr. Strangelove. Oh, that's hilarious. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and so the syndrome can sometimes affect other limbs, and it is possible to pinpoint a part of the brain that's having the problem. Um, and, you know, it's it, it's kind of associated with brain trauma, like specific area of the brain gets um, messed up from like tumors or strokes, aneurysms. Uh, closed head injuries. Um, but it's also, I found this kind of interesting, also affected by the disease process 
Creutzfeldt's Jakob syndrome, mm-hmm. which is a prion disease of the brain, also called in cows mad cow disease. Mm-hmm. So um, a lot is known about, you know, there's a lot of things that cause this. It is probably distressing to the person. Can you imagine, yeah. you know, the blowback they get from the community? Um, but it's also relatively easy for medicine, a good neurologist, which our access to care, I think, for this problem would be on the tertiary care level. Mm -hmm. So at UCSF or maybe OHSU or something, but a good neurologist could pinpoint it. And I got a feeling it could be treated pretty easily, um, depending on the underlying disorder. Sure, sure. Yeah, or Krefeldt's Jakob is not really treatable. Wow. But it also can be a variation of Parkinson's. But I don't know why they call it alien hand syndrome, because Dr. Strangelove, I thought, was... <laughs> why do they call it Strangelove hand? Exactly. I know. Because <laughs> you must... have to wear the leather glove. Then, I know. <laughs> um, it must be quite distressing to people. But I, I think if they got to the right care, that there would be some help for them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. The next one... Um, I brought up because um, a lot of people use colloidal silver, and that is one cause of this. So this uh-huh. this is called blue skin disease. Now I'm not talking about that family in Kentucky. That That's what I was going to ask. No, yeah, uh, no. I'm talking about what colloidal silver does to you when you use it too much for okay. too long. Because um, that that was like genetic, right? Right. The they have a metabolic. And, yeah. And genetic metabolic thing. And this on. is this is more environmental. Yeah, this is more something we could see up here, mm-hmm. although I never have. But um, so it's also called, an, this is hard to pronounce, Argyria, mm-hmm. probably. Um, and it's a rare condition that happens when silver builds up in the body over a long period of time. So the change in the skin color, it, and the skin kind of goes from um, like a blue gray, and it's permanent. Ooh. And it's not only skin. So it starts in the gums mm-hmm. and kind of in the head area, hangs out mostly in sun exposed areas. But also, if you cut somebody open, you could see their internal organs are discolored too. Wow. I wonder if a brain could be like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, stay tuned. I'll find that. You can um, find that out. Okay. Yeah. Although it is more common in areas exposed to sunlight. Um, a lot of people use colloidal silver here as an alternative medication, mostly when they have colds and stuff. Really? Yeah. A lot of people in like Humboldt what, County is, is super it, popular. Like, is it like akin to like zinc, like a mineral like that that you would take for... for- it's a data-free zone, so I don't even okay. know that I could answer that. Right, right. Um, but it, it also, um, this particular discoloration shows up in people who are like jewelers who are working yeah. with, with silver occupationally. Wow. And it really does take years. It's painless, but it's <laughs> weird, weird looking. looking. <laughs> um, and I think... I think if a provider walked in the room, you know, we we spot you guys as soon as we walk in the room, we're collecting data, and mm-hmm. um, it's a little creepy to think about it, but that's what good providers do. Um, and I think it, it could be alarming at first because it kind of implies that the, there's no oxygen carrying capacity in the blood. Right, right. And that maybe somebody is like on their way out or something, but it's not. It's just, a, it's most for the most part, a permanent harmless discoloration. I'll be. A lot and of people is it, don't really seem to know it's risky, is, which surprises me. Well, you know what? Know what's risky? That getting colloidal it is a risk. Silver has, okay, has yeah. a downside. So is it? And it's a. Uh, is it? Is it like localized hands, fingers, or once no. it's in your body, Mm-mm. it just goes in and it's no, your organs? It looks like and a weird alien thing. Wow! Wow! Yeah, you know, like you just don't metabolize oxygen because you're from another planet or don't something, or you don't have hemoglobin as an oxygen carrying component. <laughs> or, you know, some, I don't know. Um, but it's this is kind of interesting. This tendency for silver to change the color of the skin has changed the way we take care of burns over the course of the last, I would say, 10 years. Really? Probably. How so? So we used to, for um, partial thickness burns, which is the old um, first and second degree burns, we used to use um, silvadine which is a silver kind of a balm or something mm-hmm. that you can put on the burn. It immediately helps with pain. So, um, and it does, it's mild um, antiseptic. So it helps, 
you know, keep the bacterial count down as the skin is healing from uh-huh. the bottom. But it also turns people blue, apparently. And permanently? Was yeah, it enough silver then to do that? Thing. Wow. Okay. But it's localized in this case. Mm-hmm. It's not generalized. Okay. And so um, definitely has fallen out of favor, although a lot of people still kind of use it. Um, but right now, w- what we do is we use bas- a layer of bacitracin, which mm-hmm. kind of accomplishes the same thing without the risk of discoloration. Wow. Yeah, kind of interesting. <laughs> What's this? And then the next one. <laughs> These next two are kind of weird. But, um, so the next one is foreign accent syndrome. Wow. Is that what it sounds like? No, it's actually... the. The understanding medicine has about this is really, it's not an affectation. Okay, so it's not somebody just trying to sound like they just got back from Paris and now they're all things Parisian. Yeah, no, 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 that's yeah. not what it sounded so like. So the first report in 1907 with about 60 cases reported in the last 100 years. Um, and it's typically the result of a brain injury again, like a stroke, head trauma, or dun, 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 oh, migraine. Oh, the migraine. The migraine. Um, but it can sometimes have kind of a combination of actual neurological and psychological problems. Mm -hmm. But specifically, and this is what blew me away about this, the thought is that the cerebellum, so that's part of the brain, Mm -hmm. right? We usually think of it as a balanced thing, um, that somehow there's a trauma to it and it actually caused mechanical changes and how people speak. Mm -hmm. So they're not really speaking with a foreign accent. It, the observer, the hearer, right. Um, kind of interprets that. But for whatever okay. reason, they're treating, you know, their yeah, they're vowels just moving a different their way. mouth right. in a different way. Wow. Because their cerebellum is kind of not working well. Um, so it it's a word formation problem that affects vowels more than consonants, which mm-hmm. I thought, why would it be that? Cerebellum doesn't really know what's a vowel and what's a consonant. Maybe it has something to do with positioning the mouth or well, something, or the tongue. Uh, consonants, consonants happen in the mouth, and vowels happen in the throat and the larynx, and the and, and okay, and that, maybe that's, that's something. That's actually an interesting thought. So, um, there's also changes in pitch and tone mm-hmm. of speech, um, and it's possible that speech theory can be can actually retrain the brain to speak normally. Mm-hmm. Sure, but people who have this. It's it's not like they're really aware they're doing it. To Do they them, not hear it? They don't. It, it, I think if it's pointed out to them, mm-hmm. they they can hear it. But also, um, it's more it's more the in the perception of speech, not really the um, or origin of speech. Yeah. Okay. So super weird. So the last one. I'd, I'd, People who have this, I don't mean to laugh. People who have this are, are, <laughs> on, are on, on the whole quite appalled because <laughs> this does cause in some people for a short period of time a real aberrancy in their behavior that's different from who they are known to be by their family and their community. Okay. So this is called a Jerusalem syndrome. All right. Oh, oh, I've, Super oh, yeah. Weird. No, I've read about this. I have yeah. read about this. Yeah. And it's shown up in, in the media and we'll talk about that in a minute, but this is a group of disease entities. So a syndrome um, where a person has, is pre- most of the time previously psychologically normal um, but gets a psychosis after visiting Jerusalem. Right, right. Right. And it, it's like it can, you can, it can become like you're the Messiah. It can exactly. be all these things. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter what your what your religion of origin is. Mm-hmm. It, 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 most people usually become the Messiah or God or something like that. Wow. And then they go around acting like it. Yeah. So that means they're dressed in you know, appropriate Jesus robes, I guess, at least how the culture sees it. And, you know, they're sitting in the town square and, you know, I don't know, sitting by the lepers or something. It's but, just... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and gotta it, go wash some feet so yeah. this is and wow wow but the cool thing is for the most part it spontaneously resolves a few weeks after leaving jerusalem you have to leave jerusalem for and that so the city seems to be the only trigger so there you must be something about the environment there or the i don't know the zone or the vibe or I don't know. Wow. And, wow. And, and again, it doesn't matter what religion you are going into it or even if you're religious or not. Well, I have so many questions about that, too, right. and I question the methodology. So it might not right. matter. So does this, 
The you sample say, size is small. There's right. A, we're not talking about very many people. But when you say it doesn't matter what religious background you have, you're, are you just referring to Christian Jews or Muslims? Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Well, okay, oh, yeah. But, but it's that's so, the, my source said that was what they principally looked at. I'm just wondering if they, well, yeah, sure. And that would make sense then. But A, how religious are they beforehand? Right. And do people right. just visit Jerusalem just, you know, on a goof as a vacation? Or sometimes I would imagine people like antiquities or something. Okay, sure. Right. Yeah. If you're, say, I don't know, Hindi, <laughs> do you, are you also susceptible to this? You know, that's if you like ancient archaeology of the Middle West and uh, Middle East. I th I think there is, I th I think people can be drawn there for a variety of sure. reasons. Sure, mostly religious. I take that point, but not always. Yeah, yeah, so, and I'm just wondering how that in, and in how, this small you know, sample size how who that ends up actually having this of right that diverse group. Of right, because it would be more something if you were from a non, you know, if you didn't have any skin in the game in right. Jerusalem and that still hits you then you could go whoa hey what's going on here but you know if you just kind of are bringing these unconscious cultural triggers along with you because right. you're Jewish Christian or Muslim so there are similar and this is probably the place to talk about it there are similar syndromes for people in other cities and and in my reading they were um, specifically talking about um, people of um, Asian descent mm -hmm. You know, like Japanese, they reference specifically, who have a great interest in tourism in Paris, going to Paris and... And, and kind of being converted in and that being regard? being like French. Right, Not necessarily right. being Jesus, but being yeah, French. Yeah. Um, and... And then when they leak, because the the culture is has such a high value on it that they kind of internally incorporate it while they're there. Wow. And then they leave... It wears off, then they're okay. And then you could also you come back and you've got the uh, the the foreign accent syndrome too. I mean, these I things can you dovetail. Could, like you that. could just do all <laughs> kinds of stuff. So, of the Jerusalem syndrome, there's actually three types. Okay, so uh -huh. type one is imposed on people who have underlying mental illness. Okay, sure. Okay, mm -hmm. so they're already kind of wobbly, and you know, they go into it, and for some reason, it makes sense to them in the moment. Um, type two are people who are culturally overfocused, so that's kind of the the also the Parisian syndrome, I mm -hmm, guess. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, just value the significance of the city to such an extent that they incorporate it personally. But number three happens to people who are previously totally normal and actually become psychotic. Wow! So they are convinced. Now they, they, they like they're Jesus representing the second coming. Oh my gosh! And they had pictures of people sitting sitting around, you know, lost in this psychosis, and they go to great lengths to represent themselves as who they think they are. That is, oh my gosh! Yeah, they got the flowing robes and the long hair and all that. Um, <clears throat> and then when they leave the city and it goes away and they go back to their usual normal self, they're really embarrassed. <laughs> really yeah. um, I hope I, they get something positive out of it. Uh -huh. um, but I think this actually needs more study because this isn't even in the in the diagnostic codes. So this really? is wow. super recognized yet, probably because medicine or psych psychiatry doesn't really know how to get a handle. Maybe they on just it. want to stay away from it. And again, <laughs> because it's a syndrome, it's probably mm -hmm. a bunch of different things so it's, right. it's complex to tease think, out. so this was on the simpsons this was on the simpsons, <laughs> simpsons. of course everything's been on homer the simpsons. developed it which <laughs> oh my but it's also what was on the x-files and a bunch of was movies okay. have been made of people experiencing this wow. and that are um fictionized most of them and there's in histories like there's all sorts of i try to call some up in my mind and i can't but you know people who have gone spent time in the holy land and and you know come back as, as the head of their own cult you know right. that sort of thing. Yeah, the Knights wonder... Templar and that kind of stuff. Makes oh my you God! Wonder. Right? Yeah, because it yeah. has was has been Ooh. described in antiquity Ooh. all the way back to that. So, How did this influence uh, European and Middle Eastern history with the Crusades yeah, and everything? Oh my God! When, wow. and, and what do you do when you're Jesus for two weeks and then you wake <laughs> up and you're and you're normal? And, you know, and you're back to your 
mundane human self. Whoops. I mean, <laughs> not only are you perhaps embarrassed for your, but maybe you want to keep the Messiah thing going, you know? Yeah, right. It's a good look for you. It's, you know, yeah, it's working out. Yeah. <laughs> I look so, good in sandals. So, oh my God. Um, yeah. So That's hilarious. There are things that our bodies do to us sometimes. Okay. Super so, misunderstood. This week, last week, uh, uh, what are your favorite syndromes to, to, that you that you've learned about? What is my favorite? Yeah. Um, I mean, the Jerusalem syndrome I, is something. I, yeah, that's, it makes me want to go there and see what. You want to? You really? You going to put yourself in that situation? Toss my chips see? in and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Although I, I don't, really, I have an interest in Jerusalem in the archaeologic sure. aspect of sure. it, but I find it a little too, I don't know, alien to me. I yeah, guess. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, you know, the, the violence in the area and blah blah blah. Yeah, there's all yeah. kinds of reasons I think they to could avoid. Do it better. They could, yeah, you're right. <laughs> okay. They um, need a new Messiah to rise up and, you know, to yeah, explain how they can... I, 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 but I've been told all my life the new Messiah is not going to be a female gender, so... Oh, well, you know, not... See, oh, so you I don't just, really feel like I don't, I'm invited like to that game. Sounds like so, you're copping out on this. I yeah, think it's time totally. to change some minds here. What was... Uh, okay, so you've got here a note at the end uh, uh, about uh, homeless clinic and uh, medical and mobile medical. I see you're in scrubs. Yeah, is that where you're on your way? Today, so I'm on my way to the, it's the a homeless clinic. Beautiful day right. for that. We have our bus. Our It's actually a dental bus, but mm-hmm. it's um, it'll be a good place to hang out in between patients. And um, I, Dr. Uh, Andrew Turner has been the physician who's largely staffing this, but he's on... Um, probably a surf vacation in Costa Rica, well-deserved oh, wow. break. So I'm covering the fort for him. And so we'll be there from noon to, I, I think four is a good bet. Five is a possibility. Um, but try and get there early. I, You know, typically they have food, but I don't know that they have it today. Mm-hmm. Typically they have clothes, mm-hmm. which are helpful to people who can't do laundry. And um, typically they have things for wound care and sunglasses. And um, per, you can get a lot of prescriptions there. Like if you're out of your inhaler, you don't have to walk all the way into town to oh, wow. go to one of the closed pharmacies for the weekend mm-hmm. to try and get your meds. So um, it's it's also, they've been accepting um, people passing through town um, for medical care and also people that kind of live on the periphery that are housed mm-hmm. um, and have access to care, but um, maybe you know, just have a small problem that they wonder if it can be easier to take care of than go into the clinic. That's really, that's wild. That's fair. Do you, on a day like today, which is we're in like the first real week of the break uh, of of spring and the end of the rains, knock on wood, at least, you know, they'll be back Wednesday, I hear. Uh, but the uh, uh, do you expect a lot of people showing up on a day like today, or is this something where you I don't think, see a lot? But of I, I I think yes, because you know it's a chill vibe and people are dropping by. Mm-hmm. Do you guys sometimes they have food, um, sometimes they have donuts, you know, stuff like that. Um, but I, I, that doesn't always translate into medical visits. That translates into like people picking up wound care supplies or right, something. Right. So, but at, at the most, I've seen about ten people there, and. Uh, I um, tend to draw in women who have women-related issues, so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that's I'm fine with that. Do they know beforehand that you'll be there, or is it just a day of no, sort of discovery? No, but this, this is how it works. Mm-hmm. This is the Del Norte grapevine. Okay. It's super cool to watch. So, you know, some people happen to be going to the Super Red, you know, to pick up a cup of coffee or something, and then they go back and they tell everybody in the swamp, oh, it looks like open doors there, because sometimes it's not. You know, sometimes because of weather permitting yeah. or, or staff shortages, they, they just don't show up. But they're trying to be more committed to it. Um, and then people start kind of coming out of the swamp, you know, and seeing what the vibe is and mm-hmm. what's going on, what they can get. So it's that kind of definitely tests the waters. And yeah, sure, fine. sure. Um, and a lot of people know me because I've been in the community a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Turner doesn't always have that advantage but i will tell you we are there to treat syphilis Uh-oh. so if you have syphilis and you're living in the swamp although they're not going to hear this today i imagine um that's actually a big part of what we do and it's easy to get it done is that a particular problem right now it is oh wow it, it's insane and it's um unfortunately i'm seeing it um well after never having seen it in most of my career, really I'm seeing a lot of it. Wow! Wow! Okay. I saw it in the beginning of my career, and then it was, it was like a non-entity, and uh-huh. now it's back. Huh? 
So is it the same syphilis? It hasn't come up with like super gonorrhea kind of thing, right? Is it syphilis? No, it this still is easy to treat yeah. as long as you know you have it, but it's super under the wire sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And for a pregnant woman, that's a catastrophic diagnosis to pass to her fetus. Right, right. Congenital syphilis is pretty awful. Hmm. So, And so then the next thing too, this kind of segues into exciting things happening with mobile medical. Mm -hmm. Open Door is going to get their um, mobile medical bus. Is which it coming? Is, yeah, it's supposed to come in May. Ooh, nice. Okay. Yeah, there's okay. been like definitive talk about it, and Dr. Turner and I are um, talking to the administration because, of course, we have our hands all over. You're already, it, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and we got ideas. You got your your, your, um, <laughs> your class C or class A driver's license or something. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But Oscar, we have we have our um, our great helper. Oscar mm -hmm. actually drives the bus around. Mm -hmm. But I. I'm like exploding with ideas on it. And so any feedback to open door right now, um, like, you know, this bus should go up to the Gasky river race in July because wow. people are going to get hurt. This should be at the JC's. Um, oh my God. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the tournament so that we just had. Don't think about it as just being something for the, for the, for the homeless outreach no, clinic here, but it's community wide. No, this is amazing. It should maybe be down on front street mm -hmm. or maybe um, they definitely need somebody to take care of Oric and the Humboldt County providers are less excited. Park it there a day a week at the yeah. family resource center but, when they're handing out food. Food. Yeah, completely. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I, I'm all over the Smith River every other Sunday uh -huh. um, because that's the day the migrante population has off. Out the by old, the market there, by the La Jolla day. market? It could be. Yeah. Um, and so, and what I'd like, because I don't like rules in medicine, <laughs> is um, to take it up to uh, St. Tim's. Oh, God, right. Yeah. I don't know if that's possible. To take it over the border in, yeah. into Oregon? Wow. I, I don't know if that's possible. Huh. Um, but... If you don't think about it, then it, it, it's then it easier to happens. ask for forgiveness than permission. Right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> so ideas like that are super exciting to me. Um, you know, it could go to the farmer's market. It could go to anywhere where where somebody could conceivably have a medical need. Right. That's a great so, idea. So how can they get those any sort of suggestions to you? Just call contact Open Hilda Door? Contreras mm -hmm. at um, Del Norte Community Health Center. Mm -hmm. She's the mastermind behind all this. And, um, you know, if you have an idea that you think would be worthwhile, then please share it. And like maybe crabbing season going down to the marina. Right. Right, because those guys get hurt. Get those off, get off the boats, crazy. right? When they come in off the They're boats at the crazy. end of the day, crazy. Yeah, crazy, they huh? get hurt all the time. Oh, okay, okay. Because you know, they're, they're actually fearless when yeah. you think about it. Right. And then, of course, this brings me to UHS, which has a slightly smaller, um, has a, a one exam room, um, brand new bus, which is parked in town. So eyes on, it's in town. Mm -hmm. And, you know, taking that up to brush stanches, maybe. I think right. if it's smaller, then it might be able to four wheel better, you know, like take it up into the Glen mm -hmm, or... Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Tolua Nation and UHS extends up into Southern Oregon. Right. So they might have a better time for UHS clients accessing Southern Oregon, and maybe um, that would be helpful to them. Wow. Or Oric. They do also have concerns about Oric, even though it's not Del Norte County. Wow. So yeah. um, super exciting things going on. Yeah, and all sorts of things need to happen with that, too. We need to get Redwood Voice in the bus when it's here as well and oh. do a piece on that. Yeah. Totally yeah. cool. Cool. So uh, the other thing is for next week, I was going to, um, I'd like to talk about uh, ca like cancer risk tools or disease risk tools. Like we, we looked at the American Heart Association mm -hmm. and um, how you can use that tool. You plug in certain important pieces of data. It goes through a scientifically weighted um, equation and then you can decide what your risk is and help you make decisions about mm -hmm. whether you want to go with diet and exercise to improve or whether you want to go on a statin or um, but they also have cancer breast cancer risk tools and i would not be surprised if they have prostate cancer this could be tools. like like the first line of like screening basically yeah, starting with but the... because you can do it you can mm -hmm. google the tool and yeah. then you can and the, and the questions they ask are really straightforward and then you can bring it into your provider who probably hasn't seen the tool wow. um and then you can at least start the conversation about risk stratification yeah which is important in in cancer screening that sounds wonderful and other disease all right well we'll look forward to that uh, next week on uh, okay. the next health matters thank you very right. much Lynn. thanks